Thank you, and it's a, it's a real honor to be here. I've uh, come to Arkansas a lot when I was with the Kellogg Company. Obviously, our biggest customer is here, uh, but I had never been out in the community, and it's been a real privilege to meet people and just get a sense of, of the spirit of, of, of the community. So I, I thank you also for that opportunity, and Margarita, thank you for uh, inviting me to be here. You know, when we talk about Hispanics and Hispanic leadership and um, Hispanic Americans in society, the conversation tends to be about representation. So it's, you know, what are Hispanics represented on boards of directors? Are Hispanics uh, represented in the executive ranks of companies? It's all about representation, being there. Um, and that's a great start, and I think that's a great thing to focus on, and there are a lot of organizations that focus on that. But I would say that we should, we should set our sights on a new mission, a new goal, and that is to occupy the ranks of leadership, not just to be present, not just to be represented, but to be in a position where we can lead. Um, I'm going to give you a, a little story uh, that happened to me when I was in Mexico. I started my career in Mexico City. We came from Cuba, we went to Miami, New York, we became U.S. citizens, and then my father got a job in Mexico, so we moved to Mexico. So I studied junior high school, high school, and started my Kellogg Company career um, in, in Mexico City as well. So some years had gone by and I made my way to uh, uh, being general manager of Kellogg Mexico and I did that job for five years. And one day I was talking to my boss and I said, you know, I've been here for five years, I think we've done pretty well and I'd like to move. I'd like to go on to something else and, and, and go on to bigger things. And he said, well, what are you, what are you thinking about? What, what kind of a job were you thinking about? I said, well, I'd like to run an Anglo market. And we, we used to call the uh, US, Canada, UK, Australia, which are the big cereal markets, the big per capita consumption markets, the Anglo markets. So that's kind of a Kellogg terminology. And I said, I, I want to run one of the Anglo markets. And, uh, and he was uh, kind of surprised. And he, you know, his reply was, are you sure? Uh, don't you want to be vice president of Latin America? And he, he kept asking me that kind of question. Are you sure you want to do that? And look, I mean, you could be a VP in Latin America and all these countries. And what I didn't get until after the conversation and after I thought about the conversation is that what he was really asking me was do you really think that as a Latino you can lead Anglos why don't you play it safe and just be the Latin American guy and lead Latin Americans and um, I think today as we think about Hispanic women you probably face the same question or the same doubt can women lead men? Can Hispanic women lead Anglo men? And um, I would submit to you that always keep in mind that the answer to that question is yes. Yes, you can lead people of different backgrounds and people that are different than you are. Um, so it's all about leadership. So I'd like to tell you what I've learned about leadership by observing great leaders, by just watching the way great leaders operate. And uh, they all have similar traits. Uh, and I'll tell you something, I have met great um, Anglo leaders. I have met great Hispanic leaders. Some of the greatest leaders I started the company with were in Mexico. I've met great African-American leaders. I've met great Asian leaders. I've met leaders that are, who are tall. 
others who are short. I've met leaders who are thin. I've met some who are not so thin. Um, I've met leaders who are extroverts, and I've met leaders who are painfully shy. So there's no special, um, you know, physical or gender or personality trait that's going to make a great leader. Uh, yes, yeah, some people are born with great talent, and but it doesn't mean that if you're not born with those specific talents that you can't grow to be a great leader. I have seen it. So um, the, there is no screening process. Everyone has a shot. And let me tell you about four traits that I've observed. Four traits that at least all of the great leaders I could think about have shown these traits. They have other traits, they have, you know, um, each of them have individual characteristics, but they all had these four things. Um, the first one is they all had a tremendous will to lead. You know, I, I know a lot of people who like to be the boss, but that doesn't mean that they have the will to lead. That they actually enjoy the daily struggle and grind of being a leader. You know, they actually enjoy coming into the office and feeling the pressure um, and not walking away from problems, but actually walking towards problems. And they enjoy having the weight of their organization on their shoulders. They have tremendous will. Um, and I think about women and the will that women have to show in their daily lives to balance family and work and kids, that is an exercise of sheer will. So there's no question that you have that will and, it, and if you have the will to make all those things work, uh, I can assure you that you have the will to lead. The other thing about great leaders is that they all believe in something bigger than themselves. Uh, if people think that you're in it for yourself, that this is all about you, that you're only thinking about your promotion, that everything is centered on your life. They'll work for you because they probably need the job, but I don't think they'll follow you. And there's nothing more demotivating than people to think that they're working for someone who only cares about themselves. So the great leaders who I've observed, they always think of something bigger, they believe in something bigger, whether it's the institution, whether it's the project that they're leading, whether it's the department that they head, whether it's the team, whether it's the cause, whether it's the constitution, but it's something bigger than just that one leader. Um, and I'll tell you, when people see that, when people see that you believe in something bigger than yourself, it's incredibly inspiring. And, and it, it, it motivates people to be, to, to want to follow you and to admire you because you put something ahead of your own self-interest. Again, um, I think of women, uh, whether it's, uh, obviously today we're talking about Hispanic women. And I have, obviously I grew up in a Hispanic household um, so I grew up with Hispanic women, um, starting with uh, my mother and my grandmother. I don't have any sisters, uh, but I've observed this. If, if you think about a woman's life, they all believe in something bigger than themselves. It's all about the family, the work, the children, keeping it together. Um, it's very hard to find a self-centered, 
selfish woman. And I don't say that to try to ingratiate myself with you, but think about that. It's, it's the weight of everything that you're carrying. So you have that trait, um, and it actually comes pretty natural. The family, the relatives, the kids, the community. Um, I'm not sure I can say that about all men, but, um, and I feel I can say that because I am a man, so, you know, but, um, but I think it's more prevalent among women. A third trait, which is, uh, for me, uh, incredibly uh, key, and I tell you, I wish I would have known this 30 years ago, but it's, it's being self-aware, self-awareness. Great leaders know who they are and who they are not. They know what they're good at and they know what they're not good at. They understand themselves. Um, when I started leading people, I was unbearable. And I didn't realize that till later. I thought that if you're the leader, you have to have every answer, you have to do all the talking, you have to win every argument because you're the leader. That's what leaders do. You know, that's, that's, that's what taking charge is all about. Uh, the real job of the leader is to understand themselves, what they're good at, what they're not good at. No one is good at everything. And then surround yourself with people who are good at things that you're not good at. Surround yourself with people who complement your own skills. Um, once you get to that point, it just, it, there's, it's almost peace of mind because you get to the point where, you know what? I am comfortable with who I am. And I am comfortable and I have the self-confidence to know who I am and what I do well and what I don't. But look at my team. And this is why diversity is so important. Because you need that different, um, different perspective. Uh, imagine a team uh, of introverts, right? If you chose a team and you're an introvert, so I'm going to surround myself with people who are just like me. Um, and you have a meeting, I don't, I don't think they talk a lot at that meeting, right? Because they're all kind of shy. And, um, a team of all white males. Are there going to be real differences and different points of view? Um, a team that is trying to appeal to the Hispanic community, but they don't have any Hispanic executives. Um, but it's, it's the self-awareness that drives you to understanding that you need diversity, not because it's fashionable and not because you're supposed to have a diverse team, but because you need a diverse team. And that self-awareness will make you vulnerable. And, and I'll tell you, people love vulnerable leaders. People love leaders who understand that, that they're just as human as everybody else. Um, but, it, but it's a tremendous sign of self-confidence. Uh, let me tell you another story about what helped me in, in my career. I had a secret weapon. Uh, and that secret weapon was I had a role model, and uh, that role model was a gentleman by the name of Roberto Goizueta. And uh, I've, I've told the story twice already, so I'm sorry if you've heard it before. But I was uh, running Kellogg, Mexico. I was in my early 30s, and I picked up a copy of Fortune magazine, and there on the cover, it has a picture of this Cuban-American who had just become CEO, chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola company. I couldn't believe it. But what that did for me is it gave me someone to follow. And I, for the rest of my career, I couldn't get enough to read about this man. 
I read everything written about him. I read everything written about the Coca-Cola company. I think I knew as much about Coca-Cola as I did about Kellogg's because I had someone to look to. I had someone who had shown me the way. And I can't tell you how powerful that was. Now, Roberto was Cuban-American. He had a very strong Cuban accent when he spoke English. And he was a, a bit, I would say, on the introverted side. So he wasn't a big public speaker, and he wasn't the backslapper, and uh, he was a very thoughtful man, and he was very good at financial strategy. I mean, he was, he was amazing. So, um, as his number two, because he understood himself and he understood what he was good at and what he wasn't good at, he picked as his number two person, as his COO, chief operating officer, a backslapping, extroverted, great speaker as his president. So, an example of self-awareness. But the amazing thing for me is that Don Quixote, who was Roberto's number two man and his right-hand man, was his competitor for the top job. And there were people on the board who thought that the job should have gone to Don Quixote. But he named him president and COO. Why? Because for Roberto, there was nothing more important than the Coca-Cola company. He believed in something bigger than himself. That institution was his life. That institution gave him a career. And he believed that his role was to preserve and grow and make that institution prosper. And you saw it in his actions. And, he was a trip. and you look back at that time period from about 1984 to 1996 when they were together, and it was one of the greatest periods of the Coca-Cola company in terms of results, in terms of, of, of actually making it work. And you talk to people from Coke, say, did you know Roberto? Well, I didn't know him that much because he's a little bit shy, and, but we loved him because we knew that he was always thinking about the well-being of the institution. The last thing is simplicity. Uh, leaders, great leaders don't confuse complexity with sophistication, okay? Um, leaders communicate, they don't try to impress. Um, I, I, I know many of you have been in meetings where person comes in to make a presentation and they have you know this 45 minute PowerPoint and they've got charts with arrows and circles and uh, confusing numbers and uh, very complicated and and nobody's asking a question because people are thinking boy if if I, if I ask a question it's gonna show that I don't understand this very sophisticated stuff he's presenting no wonder he's an executive vice president. He understands this, this, these charts. The problem is nobody else understood them. So they walked out of the meeting and they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what the charge was because this executive, he was trying to show them how smart he was. And he was trying to make those charts so complicated. Um, since we're in, uh, in Arkansas, the home of Walmart. I've got to tell you this story, and I know there's some people from Walmart here. I came to a meeting, one of those Saturday meetings uh, a while back when I was at Kellogg, and um, the CEO at that time was David Glass. He, he got up and presented some charts, and the, these were big concepts. This was like the strategy of the company, and one chart said, Show them the price. And I was saying, my, what is this? You know, this, is this Walmart? I mean, it, it sounds like it's a, a little store, a little, a little corner store. Show them the price. Is that really a strategy? But what that meant and what it means 
and I don't know if they still use this, but it meant when you walk into a Walmart store, what you're going to see is a lot of displays and a lot of big signs that show you that they've got some great prices. It's all about merchandising. And anytime you walk into a Walmart store, the first thing you do is you probably trip over a display or a big sign that says $1.99. It's merchandising, it's marketing, it's what they do for a living. Show them the price. The second thing they put up, it was a chart that said, take the customer's money. Well, what the heck is that? You know, I'm always used to seeing these complicated charts and you know arrows and circles and for them it meant that customers shouldn't be waiting in line for too long. So that if a customer is waiting in line for a certain amount of time, there's a likelihood that that person won't come back or there's even a likelihood that the person will say, you know what, I'm out of here. I don't have time to wait in line. So make sure you have enough aisles open so that customers can get in, buy their product, pay at the cashier, and leave. So for me, it was just an incredible example of a company that didn't confuse complexity with sophistication. And you look at the success of Walmart today. The, the, the one other thing I would say, uh, especially to Hispanics, Hispanic women, uh, whatever job you do, you are in business and you are a business person. And don't let anyone kind of pigeonhole you as there's the business and then there's you. There's the business people, the people who understand the numbers and the people who run the show. And then we have, uh, you know, a Hispanic woman who does something else. Now, you're a business person. And learn the language of business. And be as much as a, of a business person as anyone else in the company. Um, because if not, then it's too easy. It's too easy to, to let people put you in a spot and keep you there. I was on a panel the other day for women on boards of directors. And we were talking about why aren't there more women on boards of directors and what can companies do and uh, what, what is the problem. And I, and I mentioned, look, I, I sit on a board where the lead director is a woman, uh, the chair of the audit committee uh, is a woman and another board, and in one board, the chair of the nominating and corporate governance committee is a woman. And, uh, and, and people talked about how, you know, women bring a certain perspective and they're different than men. And, and, and that's all true. Um, but I'll tell you one thing that stood out uh, from that, from my experience on boards, is that I never saw an ill-prepared woman. I never, I never sensed that, boy, she didn't come, she didn't read the book. A lot of men who went there and tried to, you know, wing it and ask a couple of good questions, and it, but the women were prepared. And, and why? Perhaps it's because they know that they're underrepresented. Um, perhaps they feel like I've got to prove myself. Um, and you know what? I don't think that's all that bad. I think it could be an advantage. It could be an extra motivator, especially if you're a Hispanic woman, then you have two things to prove. And if that means that you, are, you work a little bit harder and you get more prepared than the others, that's fine. That's just part of the price that we're all paying. It's part of our role. It's what other people have done before us. It's what other immigrant groups have done before us. And that's just the way it's, it's done. Uh, but but don't, don't see that as a disadvantage. Uh, I'm just going to close out with another story. I was, uh, I was once at an off-site uh, about diversity. And one of the top executives was talking about work-life balance, OK? and how work-life balance is also a 
responsibility of the employee, not just the company, but the employee has a responsibility for work-life balance. Um, and this person was a, uh, a very high executive, a very, very senior executive. And, um, and he said, for example, if one day you have a, your son or your daughter has a softball game or a little league game, just tell your boss, hey boss, today I'm leaving at three o'clock because I want to go see my, my son's little league game. And it just hit me. I had never been to a little league game with my son. And as I think about why, it's probably because I didn't want people to say, yeah, of course, this guy, he's Cuban. All, that's all Cubans like is baseball. So he takes the afternoon off and he goes to a Little League game. So I look back and I say, do I regret that? That's probably just the price that you have to pay. It's probably just an immigrant's experience in trying to break through, in trying to ensure that they are never never underestimated. Um, so we do have an added burden. And Hispanic women have double that burden. You're a woman and you're Hispanic. And our role is to prove ourselves. Right? We have to do that. It's just part of, it's part of what we're confronting. It's part of our struggle. It's part of our challenge. And so many trailblazers before us have had to do the same thing. And now it's our turn. There's one thing that I'm convinced of is that we're gonna see a lot of Hispanic women in leadership positions. It may not be tomorrow, but just keep looking and keep looking around and find one that you would like to emulate and learn everything you can about her, read about her, watch how she dresses, how she walks, how she talks, why she got to where she got. And that will be an, an amazing, powerful tool for you as a Hispanic woman as well. Um, and I am also convinced that this wave of Hispanic immigration is gonna make this a better country. And our job is to make sure that we demonstrate that and not allow anyone to pigeonhole you. Oh, you're a Hispanic woman, fine. We're gonna bring you in and you know, it's good to have you, but we're gonna put you over here. No, you wanna be in the mainstream. You wanna be leading. You want to be in the center of things. And if they don't put you there, you find your way there. But that's, that's the way that we've got to go about this. So um, I hope I've given you something to think about. It's been a real honor to be here. Um, I'll, for, I'll, I'll uh, remember this, this trip to, to Bentonville, to Fayetteville fondly. Um, and thank you for your hospitality. Thank you very much.